Okay, once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very happy to see you here in the room for the second day of uh, the 37th Asian Racing Conference. Uh, as a broadcaster, there are certain words, and I can assure you it, relate, it, it relates to every single broadcaster in the world. There are certain words that I dread having to say, so quite often they appear in my scripts. I shorten them down. One is meteorological, just about managed to say it. It's raining outside. The other one is veterinary, and I'm going to have to say that today as well. So usually in my scripts, I <laughs> cut them down to met and vet. Uh, another important day here at the ARC, and uh, we're going to open with a panel which is critical to your industry, of course, it's wagering. And then amongst other things, we'll look at vet regulation. And uh, we'll also look at the integrity uh, issue and how important that is to racing. Winfried having told us yesterday that it is also critical to racing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just a point of order at uh, the coffee break after this session, the Korean racing industry is going to hand out just a very brief survey. And uh, if you could please fill that out, it will be short, and then return it to the registration desk outside this room. That would be very much appreciated. So let's begin with what is session five of the conference, session one for today, global wagering leaders, current strategies and opportunities. And we have the panel here that is uh, going to make their own contribution. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time just to ask a few questions and get some more personal analysis from these gentlemen. So may I invite onto the stage to give your introduction to this session. Uh, he is the speaker and the chair of the session. Winfried, you all know him, Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Jockey Club and Chairman of the Asian Racing Federation, Winfried Engelbrecht Preskis. Good morning and uh, welcome to the Global Wagering Leaders session. I can only say that we have uh, the highest quality of lineup of speakers and I look forward, in a way, to the discussion and the presentations. We all know that wagering is the lifeblood of racing, and even we talked about that the brand of racing, we have to be less wagering focused. But we know in the end, in a way, what fuels our industry, which is necessary to fund our significant investments, being it hardware or software, to be competitive, we have the income from wagering. When you look at the income streams, uh, we had a presentation in Dubai that around 70 to 75 percent on average is a percentage of income which is wagering related, being a direct income when uh, racing organizations have, in a way, the wagering rights or being it through marketing the IP rights. So it's a lifeblood. What I think before uh, we come to the presentation, I would like to put the discussion a little bit in context of what we discussed uh, last time in Dubai. In uh, Dubai, we, in 2016, we shared the figures from the IGFA report. And the figures showed that the turnover for racing in the 10 years before were flat. And the economic outlook at that time was a little bit more gloomy. So, in a way, we uh, were entering in a period where there was a little bit of concern that there would be no growth. If one looks at the turnover uh, now, uh, we have seen there's a little growth, and I think especially in 2015 and uh, 16, we could see that from 14, 15, we had a growth in turnover on wagering of 4.9%, and from 6.7%, uh, from and from 2015 to 16, it was 4.9%. So that was positive, and I think if you look at the economic outlook, Going forward, we can see it's uh, relatively positive. We see that, uh, in a way, we predict positive growth rates, 3.8, 3.9%. And what we saw with a lot of jurisdictions, there's a strong link between GDP and betting uh, turnover development. If you see that your betting turnover development is decoupled from the GDP, it shows you have a structural problem. So that's uh, uh, what I think uh, is a little bit from uh, the perspective we had from Mumbai. If I look now at uh, the competition situation, and if you go back to the competition, which is in the wagering market and uh, betting market, gaming market is significantly increasing, one sees that uh, the racing betting share in the global market has been reduced from 7% in 2010 to 6% in 2016. Even we see an absolute growth, 
obviously the market has grown faster. And I think it's good to probably as a benchmarking to look what benchmarking of growth in the gaming sector we see. If one looks at the casino yield, you can see there is a resumption of growth, especially in a way there was a significant drop uh, in 2016, and that was especially due to a significant drop in one of the biggest growing gaming markets in the world, Macau. Uh, but this, in a way, has recaptured, and the uh, prediction is that in 2020, there will be in the casino growth rate on average of 5.6%, and especially if one looks at the casinos in Asia, it's even higher, it will be predicted 8.7%. What I think is uh, probably the most uh, significant uh, uh, competition, and at the other hand, if you combine it, your chance, is sports betting. Sports betting has uh, grown much higher than horse racing, and if you see what the growth is from uh, 2015 to uh, 16, we were at first time we captured again that horse racing and uh, sports betting was equal. But if you then look at the outlook from 2016 onward, uh, there's a prediction of 8.4% in the sports betting turnover, and it's 1.9% in the prediction for horse racing. Maybe as an uh, interesting comparison, the figures of the Jockey Club. We, the Hong Kong Jockey Club, we have uh, uh, very positive growth, uh, which I think is, uh, uh, I think, uh, definitely due to our revitalizing of racing uh, investment. And between 2010 and 2017, our turnover has grown agilely as a compound rate in horse racing by 6.5%. If one then looks at football, we see even a stronger growth trend, which is 13%. What's interesting to note that in horse, uh, the football turnover, still 70% of, of the turnover in football comes from our original horse racing customers. And football gave us at the other end to get a newer age, uh, age segment, younger age segments as our customers, so which enabled us cross-selling. So we see in a way it's beneficial if you can treat this as one customer base to develop your business. In Mumbai, we said what horse racing has to do as an industry. And we came up with uh, practically five imperatives we wanted to follow. We want to widen our customer base and especially embrace technology to connect directly with customers and create relevant offerings. Secondly, we wanted to develop new technology which supports a better customer experience. Thirdly, we want to take advantage, advance tort protocols in relation to commingling, because we still work with very outdated commingling protocols, which doesn't, in a way, embrace, especially the more exotic bets being put as product offerings. Fourthly, we wanted to have a concerted effort and protect our IP rights, nationally and internationally. And fifth, we want to have a supported, concerted effort of the AIF and IHFA to fight illegal and regulated betting. So with this, I think we have a pretty good framework for the discussion, and I'm glad, in a way, that we have a wonderful panel to discuss these issues further. And uh, I hand over to Anan, who is uh, the invisible man at the moment, to introduce, <laughs> to introduce the speakers. So, uh, Miss... <laughs> the invisible man is always there, but yeah. you cannot see him. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was listening very closely. <laughs> Thank you, Winfrey. Uh, okay, well, our next speaker is Masayuki Gato, who is president and CEO, I'm sure you know it, of the Japan Racing Association. And Gato-san is going to speak about expanding horse racing's international footprint uh, via the simulcasts that the JRA is undertaking. Gato-san, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nawaz, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to be here to share with you our strategy for expanding our farm base through international simulcast and our standpoint for global horse racing development. I was sitting in a room of the JRA Simulcasting Center in Tokyo on 2nd October 20, 2016. I felt the tension in the air 
but it gave me a great sense of relief to find the steady turnover growth without any problem. The building turnover on the 2016 Pluto Arc Triumph was $40 million. About 800,000 people participated in the building. It was the first overseas race we had ever taken bets and simulcast in the history. I still remember the news of a turnover volume spread throughout the horse racing industry worldwide. This race was broadcast on Fuji Television Network, one of the Japanese nationwide free-to-air channels besides our official satellite TV broadcaster. The television rating was 10%, which means approximately 10 million people watched the pre with Trion live on television in Japan. It was back in 1958 when the first Japanese trained horse participated in a race outside Japan. Thereafter, Japanese owners and trainers had kept challenging on the overseas big races. In 1998, Seeking the Power made history by winning the pre Maurice du Guest Group 1 race in France, and we saw Taiki Shuttle's victory in the pre Jack Lumarua at the same double race track on the following weekend. Simulcasting overseas races was prohibited by Japanese law. However, as many Japanese hosts participated in overseas races, our horse racing fans raised their voices for very non international big races with Japanese runners. After years of lobbying by the JRA, and on top of that, of that there were strong demands from our horse racing fans and the Diet Members Group for Horse Racing Promotion in support of this movement. International Simulcast was finally legalized in Japan under certain conditions. The horse racing law was amended in spring 2015 during the regular diet session and thus we started the necessary preparation for simulcasting. I will tell you a basic strategy to achieve successful international simulcast. This strategy is not different from our fundamental policy for the development of our horse racing. Enhancing the social status of horse racing has been one of our principal goals for decades. Most of the Japanese looked horse racing as just gambling many years ago. We have made a lot of efforts to change such image for a long time. I think it is fair enough to say that horse racing is now recognized as a sports entertainment and casual weekend leisure in Japan. We know our strategy wouldn't work efficiently without an established position in the society. We have established a good relationship with many different types of media, daily newspapers, TV broadcasters, radio broadcasters, and magazines for maximizing exposure of horse racing in public. Horse racing promotion through the media has played an important role in our business strategy. Of course, we are currently enthusiastic about advertising via online media, including social network service. Then, we provide our customers with rich information on learners as well as stat statistical data. The detailed race forms are the first thing our customers need to bet on horse races. In other words, making a prediction in horse races completely different from playing a dice game. I will tell you what kind of information is provided for our customers when we simulcast overseas races later. Internationalization is also important. JRA and Japanese horsemen have been working hard with a view to improving the quality of Japanese horses. Our idea is that Japanese horses must be competitive at the highest level in the world so that we can attract as much attention as the most popular sports in Japan 
such as baseball and football. 2017, Longin World's Best Race Horse Ranking listed 334 horses rated 115 or higher. The number of Japanese horses on the list was 43, and it was just behind US, Australia, and UK. Many Japanese horses have participated in various prestigious races across the world in recent years, and it has helped to raise the status of horse racing as sports. As a result of our long-term efforts, horse racing has become an international sports entertainment in Japan, and 10 million people watch the pre directed triumph on television. We produce various visual advertisements and put them on major newspapers for promotional purposes if we find that overseas race is attractive not only to horse racing fans, but to our potential customers. We have an intention to make use of international competition as the world's highest stage, which can appeal to a wide range of public like the Olympic Games. All of the JR feature races are broadcast on some free-to-air channels every weekend throughout the year. We also endeavor to encourage free-to-air broadcasters to take our simulcast contents in their TV programs. Television still has great power in getting nationwide attention and creating a positive public image in Japan. All of the overseas races we take for simulcast a broadcast on Green Channel, JRA's official television broadcaster. Furthermore, 2016 and 17 Prix de Triomphe and 2017 and 18 Dubai World Cup were broadcast live in the special TV program on Fuji Television Network. Some of the Hong Kong international races were broadcast in the regular JRA racing TV program on Fuji Television Network and BS11. We sometimes host promotional events outside the JRA facilities before the races. These are the photos of our events in a department store in Shibuya, downtown Tokyo, for the promotion of the Pudrag du Trion. This kind of event does not increase a bearing turnover directly, however, we believe such events shall be helpful for the expansion of range of horse racing fans. This is a typical Japanese horse racing newspaper for JRA races. It is very complicated. <laughs> Even I, <laughs> because I cannot bear on. Anyway, the style of race forms has been developed uniquely in Japan, and very many different kinds of information are included. One small box contains a large amount of information for the horse's performance in a post past race. Most of it comes from JRA racing database. Japanese horse racing fans enjoy studying the forms and betting. They do not bet on just numbers. I can say our customers bet on individual horses with names and characters. There is a deep meaning behind this. The way of our customers' involvement in horse racing has made horse racing to be regarded as a kind of intellectual game in Japan. Betting on horses, not numbers, has helped transform horse racing from gambling into sports entertainment. This is a race forms on newspaper for the Dubai Shima Classic last March. We included a wide range of data in Japanese for overseas races at a similar level to the JRA races and delivered it to our horse racing media. We believe abundant data can encourage our customers to study and bear on overseas races, even though they are not familiar with those runners. We have the special pages on our official website featuring the overseas races we take for simulcast. There are many interesting contents regarding international horse racing, 
for our customers on those pages. We provide introduction of the, of the race, race course profile, how to read a foreign website, race history and daily reports from the race venue in addition to the basic information for simulcasting. It is also our intention to make our horse racing fans get more interest in worldwide horse racing by giving them some background and a wide range of information on the international races. This table shows average turnover for each JRA race class in 2017. The higher the race class is, the bigger the turnover becomes. Grade 1 races gathers most attention and gains the biggest turnover. As I mentioned earlier, horse racing has grown as a sports entertainment in Japan. I would say, this table has proven healthy development of horse racing in Japan. This bearing style of our customers promotes, I'm sorry, this bearing style of our customer promotes proper bearing turnover on prestigious overseas races with simulcast. We have taken a total of 22 overseas races for simulcasting since the 2016 pre Triumph and the average turnover per race is about $10 million. The basic criteria for the selection of overseas races to simulcast in Japan is that the race must be on the world's top 100 Group 1 races or equivalent to such races and top-class Japanese runners are expected to participate in it. We have advanced our simulcast project with a view to achieving our primary goal, that is, sound development of horse racing. I believe that offering the highest level international races with best horses and best jockeys to our horse racing fans will broaden their perspective to different style and culture of the celebrated racing around the world. I always emphasize to the Japanese breeders, owners, trainers, jockeys, and the horse racing media that the biggest supporter for our industry is horse racing fans. We never fail to keep this in our mind. Broad broadening of the horse racing fan base will make horse racing take root more firmly in our society. We make every effort to achieve this. We discovered through international simulcast that horse racing is the same all over the world. The great essence of horse racing is that every horse racing in different jurisdictions is promoting itself as a sport. Service shall be common asset of humankind and the value of horse racing could be shared more widely. Each country may have limitations for the promotion of horse racing by respect of legal framework. However, should horse racing across the world be more accessible to anybody, I'm sure we can all strive to work together to develop global horse racing to the maximum extent. This is all for my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to go back to Tokyo. <laughs> so Gata-san, thank you very much indeed. I understand that uh, you have another engagement, so we very much appreciate and value your contribution, and we'll try to fill the gap that you leave behind in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is David Attenborough, who's Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer at TABCOR. But I think just as importantly, David, is that you're the Director of the Australasian gaming council as well and david is going to speak to us about domestic market strategies and external opportunities sure. good morning um, i'm going to spend about 15 minutes covering three subjects uh, i've spent a lot of time on the first one which is the tabcorp tats merger over the last couple of years the second is some developments in the australian wagering market and the third one is a brief introduction to the 
media and international story that, that Tab Corp uh, is driving um, forward. So first of all, the merger. It completed in December last year, in 2017, after two years of hard work, and at times we didn't think we were going to get it over the line. These, these are tough mergers to get done. It's brought together two of the iconic Australian gambling companies and has created one of the world's largest publicly listed gambling companies. And it's diversified across three businesses. 48% is wagering and media, 38% is lotteries, and about 16% is our gaming services side. And we have over 2 million customers, and we um, are uh, essentially a $12.1 billion uh, enterprise. Now, this model that is TabCorp is a model that delivers about 70% of its revenues back to the community. And it does that via payments to the racing industry, payments to the government in form of taxes, and payments to our venue partners. And we have over 9,000 retail venues. We are the largest retailer in Australia. And when we look at what we pay to racing as a combined entity, we now pay more than a billion dollars per annum to racing. And that underpins the over $670 million in prize money that is paid every year in Australia for racing in Australian racing. It also underpins a vibrant racing industry. And that was uh, clearly shown at the latest Easter English sales, where we saw uh, 22 yearlings sell for over a million dollars, and we saw 124 yearlings sell to overseas money. We've got a really strong breeding industry. The 1.4 billion we pay in taxes makes us one of the largest corporate taxpayers in Australia. And the 700 million we pay to our retail venue partners ensures that we have a strong, well-invested retail footprint. And our retail extends over seven of the eight states and territories in Australia. We have about 4,300 wagering retail outlets that operate under the UBET, which is the old TATS brand, and the TAB brand, which is the old TAB Corp brand. And our intention is to move them all to the TAB brand. We also operate across the whole country digitally, and, uh, and that is under both brands still as well. Core to us is our relationship with racing. We are the major funders of the Australian racing industry, and it is inherent on us to innovate and grow that industry. And a good example of that was last year, working with Racing New South Wales and the Australian Turf Club. We worked with them, collaborated to introduce the new concept of the Everest, the richest turf race in the world. That was bought to fruition, launched, got a very strong backing from a much younger audience, saw really good international backing with international turnovers up 70% on the day, and we are driving it forward this year with prize money rising to $13 million. We also work with a number of racing clubs and have done for years. The Victorian Racing Club featured here our relationship with them goes back to 1961. Recently, we've contributed to the building of the new grandstand. We work with them, assisting them with distributing the Melbourne Cup to 163 territories around the world. And we are locked and loaded with them to drive that spring race in Carnival with over 2.3 million uh, people in Australia betting with the tab on that day. So, developments in Australian racing. Um, I last talked to you back in 2014. I couldn't make the 2016 uh, conference in Mumbai. Back then, I talked about the trends, and the trends largely haven't changed. We've got strong digital growth, offsetting any decline in retail. We've got also strong fixed odds growth, offsetting any decline in paramutual. In fact, the growth has been around 6.7% in 
in the, in the wagering market between 2012 and 2016. So pretty similar to what we saw in Hong Kong. And that growth has continued. It is a vibrant wagering market. And on the right-hand side of that slide, you'll see our contribution over those years to racing as TAB continued to climb. And then in the last year, 2017, you see the combined combination, contribution of the combined TAB Corp TATS merger. We talked uh, about the, the product, the paramutual and fixed odds product. Sports product, as part of fixed odds, has grown more strongly, again, similar to Hong Kong. But that's actually been good for racing because it's brought a younger audience in and we've managed to get a lot of that, a high proportion of that audience to then move over and, can, and actually bet on the racing product as well. And we've spent a lot of time developing ways that we can introduce racing to our customers for the first time. And in developing our digital offerings, with that in mind, our digital platforms are very racing-centric. And what do I mean by that? We've integrated and we've tried to differentiate around racing. We've integrated the vision and data from our Sky Media business. We've introduced racing previews, floating vision, speed maps, and we've created a very information-rich platform for our customers to enjoy racing. We also have a strong sports betting product, but it certainly is not as well differentiated as the racing product, and that reflects where the majority of our business comes from. We are still well over 80% a wagering on racing business. Retail is massively important to us. We've talked about the 4,300 retail sites that we have across Australia. Well, these are the social center of wagering in Australia. And, we, and it's where a lot of customers for the first time experience racing. They don't experience it at a racetrack, they experience it in their local pub or club in one of our wagering areas where they can get a full service offering. And we've invested in that over the last five years heavily to integrate digital, integrate self-service, electronic form, and to ensure that there are ways that bring retail betting together with digital, such as check and collect. And we've got an aligned retail footprint that is working hard now to sign customers up to digital accounts. Now we've introduced digital commissions for them as well. And on this section, finally, I think it's worth dwelling on the regulatory landscape in Australia. The government and regulators have moved recently over the last couple of years to increase the regulation on this sector. And we support that because these moves are about creating a long-term sustainable industry. They've banned offshore operators, unlicensed operators, from taking Australian customers and put some teeth behind that. They've banned the offering of credit by bookmakers in Australia. They've made sure they've tightened up on advertising restrictions. They've introduced amend amendments that make it clear that you can't bet online in-game on live sports. And they've significantly improved the harm minimization framework and that will get tightened up later this year. We've also seen a levelling of the playing field on tax. So Tabcorp, you've seen, pays $1.4 billion in tax. And our competition in the wagering sector are capped out at about half a million dollars. So they pay very little tax, and you're now seeing the introduction of a point of consumption tax starting to happen across Australia. And that's all about making sure that the corporate bookmakers start paying uh, tax on their betting on this product. And finally, we have seen some legislation introduced in the last couple of weeks that will ban synthetic lotteries. And synthetic lotteries are disrupting the lottery business that funds hospitals, schools and charities and is primarily a major driver for the states in this sector. Tabcorp's media and international business 
the, the Sky Media business is a major driver of our wagering in Australia. It's incredibly important and it, we distribute it through a pay TV platform to 2.8 million homes, 5,000 retail venues and 360 racetracks. And we also distribute it digitally to over half a million of our customers. It's a wall-to-wall -wall channel. And what do I mean by that? It has 120,000 races a year on it. On two of those channels are completely wall-to-wall. -wall, and that allows us to really give the maximum betting opportunities a bet every three minutes to our customers across Australia. And we've been investing in this product, investing in the high definition, the way that we present it. And that's reflected in the numbers. And over the last year, where we've seen pay television declining, Sky's viewership has increased by 18%. And we've imported a lot of foreign racing. Back in 2008, we had about 1,000 races coming into Australia. Last year, we had over 50,000 international races coming into Australia. In 2008, it turned over about 300 million. Last year, it turned over over $1.1 billion for us. So we are importing a lot of international racing and we are paying those international jurisdictions to bet on their racing. It's important to note that the majority of the corporate bookmakers that pay no tax in Australia, or very little tax, are not paying to bet on this international product. We distribute Australian New Zealand racing to 60, around 62 countries, I think it is right now, around the world. And that's important, and it builds the Australian brand, and it builds Australian racing around the globe. And New Zealand racing, we also export and, and drive on their behalf. But we also have been doing some work with the KRA, and it's a great case study since we're in Seoul. So we've worked with the KRA last year, and we have introduced their racing into the US. We've set up a B pool on the Isle of Man, a host pool on the Isle of Man, and we have set up information, picture and data and delivery in the US, and that is going well. And that model, we are now looking to extend into other jurisdictions for the KRA, such as Canada, Europe, and South Africa. Pumalela, uh, well, Premier Gateway International, which is a partnership with Pumalela, is our hub on the Isle of Man. That hub is, uh, has been building over the last uh, eight to ten years, and on the back of us managing it very carefully, putting a lot of regulatory compliance and controls around it, we're now doing business with a range of jurisdictions, including the PMU, Hong Kong, the UK tote, the German tote, South Africa, uh, Finland, Norway, I, I could go on. But it's a, it's a vibrant hub, and its, mo its whole model is win-win. It's all about creating transparent, controlled commingling with multiple jurisdictions and making sure that the KYC, Know Your Customer, and AML controls are absolutely in place. So finally, the merger has created one of the largest publicly listed gambling entertainment companies in the world, and we're really focused on working with Australian racing and international racing on investing and continuing to innovate and grow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Yes, I'll have the ticker. Uh, Brant, if uh, you could come to the podium. Brant Dunshay is uh, Chief Regulatory Officer, recently appointed at the British Horse Racing Authority. Uh, Brant is going to give a view of British racing's wagering strategy. All yours. You need the ticker, of course.
Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, I was asked uh, to deliver this presentation on behalf of the Chief Executive of the British Horse Racing Authority, Nick Rust. Therefore, on behalf of Nick, I, I do extend his apologies that he cannot be here today, and I hope that I can do uh, justice to uh, this topic, which is, of course, uh, a, a rather complex one in the context of British racing. If I may uh, just for a moment explain the structure of British racing, which uh, as many of you in this room who will have engaged with uh, British racing uh, previously will appreciate, it, it is very complex. In its simplest terms, British racing is regulated by the British Horse Racing Authority, uh, which is a member-based organisation. It's vested with the regulatory and governance responsibilities uh, of the industry on behalf of the members. Unlike many other racing regulatory authorities or commissions around the world, the British Horse Racing Authority is not constituted by legislation and therefore does not carry the responsibilities or powers of a statutory authority. The member organisations which form this collective that empowers the BHA include the Racecourse Association, uh, the representative body of the 60 racecourses across the nation. The licensed stakeholders, including your uh, National Trainers Federation, representing the trainers, the Professional Jockeys Association, uh, and the National Association of racing staff. Also the Racehorse Owners Association and the Thoroughbred Breeders Association all collectively come together uh, to represent the horsemen's group with the licensed uh, personnel. At the core of the BHA's responsibilities are the areas of race day operations and regulation including veterinary regulation and, and equine welfare integrity services, compliance and licensing, uh, racing, which includes uh, the development of fixture lists and handicapping. It also includes uh, responsibility for communications and external affairs and corporate affairs, which includes engagement with the UK government on matters relevant to the industry collective. The member-based arrangement is established under a tripartite governance structure comprising of the BHA, the race courses and the horsemen. And following on from Susanna's excellent presentation yesterday on diversity, that also includes horsewomen, I must say. Race courses in Great Britain are independent and take lead responsibility on commercial matters, including media rights, commercial sponsorship, driving income delivered by race goer attendants on race day. The horsemen's group, including owners, trainers, breeders, jockeys and racing staff, negotiate prize money agreements and play the key role in, racing product, in the racing product supply chain, making collectively working collectively to deliver what is required to service an extensive annual fixture list. This fixture list would see on average around 90,000 total starters every year. And yet it's worth noting that 57% of those total annual starters in Great Britain are actually bred abroad. And as previously set out uh, under this tripartite arrangement, the BHA is then responsible for governance, regulation, fixture list development, coordinating the sport on its many varied levels collectively for and on behalf of the industry. In terms of uh, British racing's commercial model, uh, British, British racing, it, it, that commercial model is also very complex with different parts of the industry responsible for different or for many, for many parts of it. Incomes are generated from betting through levies. 
of monies wagered on British racing by British punters. The betting industry also contributes significantly to incomes through sponsorship, as is, of course, the case in many other jurisdictions. Income is also generated through media rights, and that is very much substantial in the context of British racing. In total, 47% of income comes from betting activities to the industry. Other incomes are delivered through non-betting related sponsorships, race day hospitality, and significantly through race goer expenditure on race days. What this all leads to for the industry uh, was in 2017, um, delivery of approximately 140 million pounds uh, in prize money, with that number forecast in 2018 under a new levy structure to grow. In terms of the industry's commercial relationship with betting, unlike in other jurisdictions, it's not vert vertically integrated with horse racing in Britain. Irrespective of that structure, racing product is strongly consumed by regular punters in the UK. Racing in Britain is the second largest product in terms of activity by profit, just behind the world game of football, However, based on volume or turnover, in fact, ranks as number one. Betting on uh, racing in Britain has grown in recent years against uh, historical trends and some other international comparators. And the betting industry is very in, a very important partner for British racing. That can't be uh, overstated with 45% of commercial revenue coming from either directly or indirectly betting activity on British racing. Importantly, recent legislative reforms, which come into effect or came into effect last year uh, to replace the previous levy on betting mechanism, which did serve the industry very well for, for many years, now means that racing is delivered a better share of direct betting activity. This of course means increased incentive for the racing industry to work in partnership with the betting industry to the mutual benefit of each other. In terms of commercial revenue uh, and the flow from betting, an estimation of how revenues were split from betting in 2017 highlights that around £175 million came through media rights, made up in the digital space of per stream fees and minimum guarantees, and significantly through the retail sector, largely via per betting shop fixed fees. In terms of levy revenues, it is estimated that approximately £40 million came pounds came via digital spend and around 45 million via the retail sector last year. Importantly, prior to the 2017 legislative reforms to the levy, which introduced last year a 10% of gross win, win model, uh, those revenues referred to from the digital space were not captured as it was solely betting from the retail sector that generated those revenues. Thus, when we consider the revenues generated via the retail sector in the UK via both media rights and the levy uh, and retail shop uh, closures, therefore, uh, as uh, have been potentially anticipated, uh, can have a significant impact uh, on the future commercial model for British racing. So that leads us to what is a very, very much a changing landscape for betting, the betting industry in Britain. As is the case globally, Britain is no different with uh, change constant and rapid in this sector. Consumers are migrating from retail to digital with more than 50% of betting on British racing now driven through digital platforms. 
Only five years ago, that was less than 30%. The younger generation of digital natives are now using these platforms to bet, and the older, traditional retail punters are becoming fewer as time passes. However, it's not just this age demographic that is a factor. Innovation, technology, product, value, these aspects are all driving this migration to digital across all cohorts. Further to this, shift in customer preference, public and government attitudes in Britain are hardening, as demonstrated by the 2018 Gambling Review. Regulation is becoming very much focused on player protection, issues of problem gambling, and uh, money laundering and such like. With the current focus on, re on the retail sector and the impending move to heavy restrictions on betting shop gaming machines will come challenges for the racing industry. With this increased regulation on gaming machines in the retail sector, horse racing will become more important to betting operators as the revenues from these machines are impacted by these restrictions. So what does this mean for British racing? Yes, there are challenges. Firstly, betting in the retail sector will likely decline significantly in the medium term as the profitability of some betting shops is challenged by restrictions on gaming machine activity. This coupled with the switch to digital, migration to digital, those impacts will, however, be transitional. And it's not anticipated that these will begin to come into effect until late 2019. It is forecast that the impacts may be in the order of 40 to 60 million pounds annually through levy loss and um, media rights losses as a consequence of, of uh, these reforms linked to shop closures. And that, of course, uh, leads to all of the great work that has been done over recent years in a collaborative sense by British Racing as a collective with the government and the racing wagering industry to deliver reforms to our levy program and structure last year. But it's not all doom and gloom for the racing industry. Whilst there will be a need for change to the future commercial model, racing and betting will be driven to work closely for mutual commercial benefit. The UK government has made commitments to support the racing industry. That obviously clearly needs to be delivered to support the grassroots of the industry, which provides such an incredibly large economic impact for the nation. The industry is supportive of the reforms, just as David just touched on with relation to reforms in Australia. The racing industry is supportive of reforms to protect responsible gambling. And as with the collaboration with betting, racing will work collaboratively with government to ensure the sustainability and health of the industry. So whilst Britain has its challenges, what comes with that will be innovation, collaboration between racing, the betting industry and government. And with that innovation and collaboration, we anticipate will come incredible opportunities into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. 
Uh, Richard Chung is uh, going to be next to speak. Richard is Executive Director of the Customer and International Relations Department of the Hong Kong Jockey Club, and we heard earlier from Goto San about Japan's efforts to internationalize its racing, and Richard is going to give you the Hong Kong perspective. Hi, good morning. Um, it is my luxury to have a chance to hear, to give an update on the Hong Kong um, racing betting market. Let me try to pull the presentation. It didn't quite work. Ah, here we go. Okay, so in previous ARC, I have actually talked about um, the, revital the revitalization strategy for Hong Kong Jockey Club. And essentially, the two cornerstone is a customer segmentation framework, as well as based on offering. Now we have identified what we should offer to different customers. Then we work on creating more event a more eventful race course. We invest a lot in front-ended experience. We revamped our betting platform and betting products invest in CLM as well as also try to work and make racing an entertainment product. And let's see. Ah, here we go. And so far we have had a good run. And last year our turnover actually grew by 10% and sorry. Yeah, last year our turnover went up by 10%, and this year we expect another 5 and 6% to grow. Now what? So we have had a good run. However, uh, we don't think we can live on our laurels. And so what we have been doing right now in the last 12 months is begin to plant the seeds so that we can continue to have another good run in the next five years. And precisely, there are three things that we are working on. One is... Uh, we, had, we move on with our segmentation and begin to look into even more micro segments within our demographics. And secondly, Hong Kong, end of the day, is a 7 to 8 million population city, and we have to expand, and commingling has been our lever. And thirdly, we have also been ex investing into new technologies, which ensure that we will stay relevant with the next generation, and especially what we call the Gen Z, which is usually people who are coming out of age and become adults. So if you look at the Hong Kong demographics, it is actually an aging population. Um, we see seniors, i.e. people above 60 years old, growing at about 4% per year. And meanwhile, if you look at the below 45-year-old group, it has actually been declining. So what, what can we do? So one thing we've been working on is focusing a lot on our senior strategy, i.e how we can keep um, our more aged racing fans, keep them engaged and give them a better environment to sustain their racing interest. We have invested in our race course on more age-friendly facilities. Um, we are doing a revamp so that a lot of our racing information in the shops or even we work with news newspaper to make a big font racing information. If you recall some of the, um, the Japanese racing form that Godosan actually showed earlier, the Hong Kong racing form, the font is not much bigger, and it's going to be more and more challenging for, for our fans, and so we have to revamp the whole way we do display. We have been putting a more of a nostalgic spin in our marketing, and also we are also working on programs to help our senior customers moving to go digital. And we have seen some good results. Um, the key metrics when we look at the senior segment would be, okay, at how many customers, it will actually be the, the attrition rate or the lapse rate. So how many people is dropping out of racing every year? And through a lot, for some of the tactics that we have done, we have actually seen our lapse rate dropping from 10.8% to 9.6% last year. And we have also seen some success to revitalize some of the racing fans who are maybe at one point when in their 30s or 40s, they are actually a racing fan and then they might actually drop off the spots because of work. But now, after they have retired, they begin with more time and then go back to racing. 
and other demographics that we are working on are uh, young female customers. And on the right-hand side, again, we have seen some success of um, actually bet active betting accounts among the below 45-year-old young female customers. And we have seen a 7% growth two years ago, and this year we've seen a good 16%. So what have we done? Essentially, we have created a brand called the Go Racing brand, which is for ladies. And we invest a lot in our race course experience so that um, for the sec particular sections of the race course, we can create, we, we can allow them to have a much more um, female-friendly environment and much more even the catering in those events will be catered maybe in smaller portion, but will be catered for this demographics. And we also create events where, you know, a group of um, girls out, they can go racing or encourage girlfriends to go with their boyfriend to go racing. So these are a lot of programs we do so that we want to keep racing relevant for this young female customers. Now, um, going to the race course is important. However, we can only do that um, two days per week because that's how frequent we can have racing. But so therefore, we must also invest in the social media, in the digital media, where they are, in, uh, where they are seven times 24. And in general, it, when you think about um, using social media, or digital media, in racing, they're really for, or a, peop, a lot of people talk about KOL marketing these days. And in racing, we believe there are actually four types of KOL. The first type with what we call the genuine racing experts. This would be the people, the tipster that I personally look at every, every morning. And they will also, secondly, in the middle, you would see a lot of the third party media agency. For example, a lot of the newspaper in Hong Kong has now moved digital and created their own social digital site. And thirdly, would be a lot of what we call ring leaders. And these are actually normal customers, but they are just racing fans, but they happen to like to impose or share their opinion across their friends. So how can we leverage this type of customer ring leader? And finally, the last type of KOL would be people who actually don't know much about racing. They would only look at racing as a social entertainment. However, they have a good fan base because of their, maybe they are, a, they, they are an artist or maybe they are such a social, social figure. And obviously, if we are marketing to the um, hardcore, dedicated racing fans, only those in the left-hand side would be important. However, when we are trying to um, target this female market, we have to change the way we do digital marketing. So we leverage, um, we are able, we're lucky enough to be able to find genuine um, commentators, female commentators who also have a good social circle um, to, um, be, to become a like opinion leader for these young um, female customers. We also work, out, work with a particular one, one or two artists who might not know much about racing, but actually, for example, um, this singer in Hong Kong, her boyfriend is actually one of our uh, very famous young owners. So as a result, we leverage figures like this. And also on the right-hand side, female ringleader. We try to approach some of our customers who actually begin to learn about racing, like racing, and then let them use their social media to um, share about their feelings, the experience of racing to the other fans. So we have to change the way we market uh, digitally to this different group of demographics. So that's an update on what we are doing locally. Now, secondly, is commingling. Um, Hong Kong has a luxury position to back up our commingling business because we do have a world-class racing product. And we also have very deep betting pools, which allow, allow to handle big volume. And finally, we have also been investing into our information base, which, so the amount of information that you can learn about Hong Kong racing is, is significant. And at the same time, we are also investing into effort to tailor-made all this information in the, in the form and factor, which are suitable or which are where overseas customs are used to be looking at. So this is a picture, our commingling business um, started in 2014, and by the end of 2015-16, we are at about 400 million of um, turnover. And then for this season, we are looking, the business has already grown four to five times, so we're looking into two billion um, market when it comes to commingling, and we'll just see that continue to grow. Now, of course, um, commingling is a B2B business. We are lucky enough that we have a 
global network of business partners, um, tow operators who can help us through a B2B model distribute our product. But how does, how, however, the way we look at it is we cannot 100% rely on our partners. We should also be investing into marketing, to B2C marketing. So for example, we have built up a network of overseas media partners, and all of them you see on this map actually carry their own carry information about the Hong Kong product. For example, in the UK, the Racing Post, you know, every every Wednesday and Sunday in the post, you will see the full Hong Kong card as well as on the online version. And we also again leverage a lot of KOLs overseas to use to use their Twitter account to tweet around. Uh, racing news in Hong Kong because that's where how um, European customers learn about and catch up with racing. And we also um, invest to create infographics and we, you, you would actually never see this ad in Hong Kong because a lot of Hong Kong racing fans would already know who Morera or Perton would be but for the, for the UK customers they might not know and so therefore we have to create um, in, in what we call infographics and display in a way that they are used to be seeing. And this next one is my favorite. It's actually a infographics that actually help UK customer to track where their favorite horses in the UK from home, and now they are racing in Hong Kong. For example, the defrocked, the horse who won the Britannia, is now in Hong Kong called Limitless. So when the UK customer look at the horse Limitless, he might recall it's actually defrocked, and he might, he might continue to make another punt on him. And then Dr. Jeff is Dr. Jeff, an Irish correspondent, become exultant, which is one of our runners in our derby. So through a lot of education like this, we believe, and you would not see any of these in the Hong Kong marketing, but we actually do it for the over, tailored just for the overseas customer. Another thing we do is we target um, the overseas Chinese. For example, if you go to Canada, and um, you would actually see that the Hong Kong racing is live on one of their major Chinese TV channels. Or when you're in Australia, you actually see the Hong Kong race card in the Australian newspaper. So these are the things that we are also investing as a value added for our B2B commingling partners. And looking forward on commingling, we still see a lot of growth opportunities. We are continue to work with our partners to try to expand the bad type portfolio into exotic bad types, which was previously limited by the ITSP protocol or by technology. And we are also explore development of bad types where it's popular overseas, but we may not offer that in Hong Kong. For example, Exacta or the forecast, very popular in America, very popular in the UK, but we actually don't have that bad type in Hong Kong. But through the longitude model engine that we have actually installed, then we are exploring in ways where, for example, we can still offer Exacta bat overseas and then convert them and merge into a TS bat, for example, in Hong Kong. So there are ways around, even on the bat type, where when we don't offer it in the local market, we can offer it overseas. And finally, we still believe that uh, we need to work as a global um, community to think about the next generation protocol, um, because the current ITSP, um, there are definitely ways to improve. And the third area that we are working on is investing into new generation technology. So you would heard a lot of, about a lot of buzzwords these days in terms of fintech, e-payments, biometric, artificial intelligence, chatbot, whatnot. Now, a lot of these does not exist in our process today. And you would all, you can ask me, okay, if we actually move from cash batting into using a mobile phone for touch and go experience, is people going to bet more? And I would tell you that the answer is probably no. However, we still need to do it because this is the way that future consumers, especially the Gen Z consumers, are their consumer habits. And with e-payment growing so fast in Asia, um, we just have to continue to adapt. Otherwise, we will, it will be very difficult for us to stay relevant with the next generation of customers. As a result, we are now working with our IT team, looking into tap and go mobile solution for our retail customers. And we are also working uh, with more development of fintech experience, of innovation in Hong Kong. We now have more chance to work with banks so that customers can transfer money in and out from their bank account or any third party, third party payment platform to the Jockey Club betting account more seamlessly. And then we are also looking into biometric. And biometric is important 
because right now, the, given the regulation of Hong Kong, the only way to open a betting account is still through, a, you still have to go to the race course or go to the betting shop. And that might not be, and maybe the Gen Z customers we, is not going to like that. And so we have to create a seamless end-to-end -end online experience for them. You know, AI chatbot for custom, customer services. Why do we need that? Because kids today, uh, because um, kind of young adults today, um, they, a lot of them actually, according to our research, prefer to talk to their family members using the mobile phone with WhatsApp or WeChat than trying to pick up the phone. So if they are unwilling to do that with their family member, why would we believe that they're willing to pick up a phone to place a bet in future? So, and also a lot of custom experience or race cost booking. So we actually have to create interfaces that mimics a social tab and meanwhile allow them to learn more about racing, book race cost venues, inquire about bet type or anything. So in future, as opposed to going to the website to scroll to find race to, what are the odds of number nine? I can simply punch, give me the, punch as if you're talking to a friend. What's the odds, what's the win odds for race two number nine? So these are the things that we have to work on and artificial intelligence is going to give racing a chance to move ahead on that. And then we are also continue to invest in our live streaming innovation. More and more pe people are now actually watching the racing live through their mobile and tablet through the, our HJJC TV. And in the new season, we are going to have two new, um, new features. One being using the um, the trackers information, then one can actually sync their TV or sync where on, on the race course signal with their mobile phone, so they can actually track where their horse is. They are now, now the horse I back on is now on my fifth position, three lengths behind the leader. And on the right hand side, we are also able to continue to break away from linear TV where you can only see one view of the paddock. You will be able to see all angles of the paddock. You'll be able to see how, um, what the horse looked like when the horse stepped out to leave the paddock and go into the turf. So give, just to give a much rich, richer racing experience and transparency to the fans, where even in the past, when they go to the race course, they can only watch a linear TV station. So these are new possibilities that we can continue to invest. And the whole key thing is about um, to make sure that racing as an entertainment product continue to stay relevant to the next generation customers. And finally, last but not least, and usually we would like to give you and also share with you our latest Happy Wednesday video. I thought it's Wednesday today, so it should work, but maybe it would only work in the evening. So maybe, so maybe with that, Maybe I'll wait till the next time you visit Hong Kong and we can watch the video together. Ah, here. Oh, yes. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. And in case I forget, don't uh, please you forget that there will be a survey which the Korean racing industry would very much appreciate if you could fill out. You'll be getting those forms after this session and then you can hand them into the res registration desk. Simon, it's your turn. Simon Bowser-Jett is the chief executive of the British Jockey Club. After Simon's presentation on British racing's pool betting, uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion with the panelists that remain. Simon. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, when we say the British Jockey Club, obviously what we mean is the Jockey Club, the first and the original. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is picking up on something that Brandt was talking about. Uh, is innovation in British racing and how British racing is going to get more involved in, in the betting industry. Before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit about the Jockey Club because uh, although we've been around a long time, we have changed a lot. So uh, we were the governing body of British racing. Um, uh, that 
2007 that uh, changed. We gave up the regulation uh, and governance of British racing, uh, and we uh, passed that on to the British Horse Racing Authority uh, as a joint, modern joint venture of all the stakeholders in racing to manage the regulation and governance. We became a purely commercial body at that stage. Uh, we're the largest UK race course group um, with uh, race courses, you know, like Newmarket, Epsom with the Derby, uh, Cheltenham, the Grand National at Aintree, uh, Sandown, Haydock, a whole lot of, uh, of the big race courses in the UK. Uh, despite the fact that we're now a race course group and less involved, really as a stake, more as a stakeholder in British racing rather than a governing body, we are still a member of the uh, IFHA. Um, as an honorary member, and we're proud to be so, uh, given our heritage in the governance of racing. Uh, in terms of the various things we get involved with, we're a partner in the Racecourse Media Group, um, which manages all our media rights uh, in the UK and around the world. We're a partner in British Champion Series, which was a new attempt in British racing to create a, a better defined structure for flat racing with a climax at British Champions Day, um, which now has the biggest, is the biggest prize money day in British racing. Uh, and these are all things that, that link back to what Winfred really talked about yesterday, which is how do we build engagement with racing? How do we build the brand of racing? That's, that's been a fundamental um, part of our mission, really, for, for uh, many years, and particularly over the last 10 years since we gave up governance. So things we've currently got uh, that we're trying to help to develop that is things like city racing. Let's run a race day through the streets of a major city. Um, that's something that uh, I think we're going to be able to do, uh, hopefully, this year. And um, we're a partner in that. Um, creating a team competition over eight weeks in the summer, uh, whereby uh, in, in evening, summer evenings, uh, big race courses create uh, 10 or 12 teams who compete against each other over a period for a big prize money pot at the end. We think that will help engage new people in, in racing. Uh, but BritBet is a core part of uh, that. That's our new pool betting service. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, returning pool betting to British racing. So let me give you a, a little bit of history. Um, in 1928, the TOTE, the Horse Race Totalisator Board, was created by Winston Churchill. Um, the aim of that was to support the racing industry with a betting service. It was the only betting service uh, allowed at that time. Uh, and it had the exclusive right to operate pool betting on horse racing in the UK. And it was run as an independent body. It wasn't run by racing, it was run as an independent body. In 1961, the whole market changed in the UK with uh, off-track betting allowed for the first time with licensed uh, betting shops. Um, and really, the market since 1961 developed primarily really as a fixed odds um, bookmaking market, not really as a tote or a paramutual market. Uh, and as part of the recognition that uh, the, the pool betting probably needed to be more integrated with racing, in the 2000s, uh, there were extensive discussions. The government actually agreed that the ownership of the tote should be transferred to racing to make sure that that was better integrated in terms of how racing and betting was presented. But that didn't happen, um, partly due to the financial crisis. So in 2011, in fact, the government uh, uh, nationalised the tote, uh, and then went through a, a process of selling it off, uh, at which they, they did to a private bookmaker, Betfred. And as part of that, uh, they had were given a seven-year exclusive license on pool betting on British racing. Now, that, what it didn't provide was the ability for uh, the tote to continue to operate on British racecourses. So we did a seven-year commercial deal at that stage, whereby the tote would continue on our racecourses and continue to uh, work on international co-mingling alongside our international media rights. And that license expires on the 13th of July this year. So from that day, a new company will launch on our racecourses, um, BritBet. It's a partnership of 55 of the 60 UK racecourses, including the Arena Racing Company, the Jockey Club, Goodwood, York, Newbury, and a number of other racecourses. The aim is to best serve the sport and its customers uh, particularly on course, by racing, for racing, and all the revenues will be retained within the sport for the first time. And race courses will take over all the on-course service with our customers. We know our on-course customers best. We spend a lot of time and investment over the last 10 years in providing fantastic customer service 
and engagement on course. Uh, and we think we've, what we've done with other areas of our business, such as catering, for example, where we've brought that in-house and managed that very carefully for our customers, improved that. We think we can do the same with pool betting. And internationally, uh, through our media rights, uh, we'll effectively help to drive commingling as well. We've put in place an experience management team. Uh, in most countries, of course, racing and betting uh, and pool betting are very integrated. That's not true in the UK, so uh, it's an obvious issue. If you're a race course group and you're starting in betting when that's not your core business, what do you do? Well, the trick is get in a top class management team, which we've done. So we have a chairman, Neil Goulden, who has run major bookmakers in the UK and actually has run the Dutch tote in the past. Our managing director, Nigel Roddis, who's here today, um, uh, who has run the tote pool before and from, uh, done international media rights for at the races. And our executive teams from in technology and operations uh, and marketing and HR come from companies like Sportec, from the Tote, from Betfair, GBC and Chesterbet, which was really the first example of a race course taking control of a betting product on its, uh, on its course. It was a fixed odds operation, but it was all around customer service. And it has support from our media rights vehicles, uh, GBI, RMG and at the races. Um, you would notice I said it was 55 out of the 60 race courses, so an obvious question, what about the other ones? Um, well, here's a quick update on what they're doing. So Ascot launched its customer-facing brand, uh, Ascot Bet, last week. Uh, it, that, that will be powered by Tote Pool um, and focused on Bet with Ascot. Um, but where possible, they've made it clear when they made that announcement uh, last week that they want to align their bet types with BritBet. Uh, to make sure that when customers go from different race courses that they're seeing similar kind of presentation. Um, Chester and Bangor, their affiliated race course, they haven't had any pool betting since 2011 um, uh, and so they're not part of any pool betting service at the moment. Uh, and Chelmsford uh, is owned by Betfred so obviously they will continue with the tote. Our aim is to drive innovation, that's really the core of this. How can we provide a better service for our customers uh, based around horse racing, really with horse racing at its core. UK pool betting over the years, not just in the last seven years, really for many, many years has withered on the vine. Less than 3% of the betting on British horse racing is through the pools. Um, that's, that's gone on for a long, long time, really driven by the fact that the UK market is a fixed odds market. And so even when the tote was independent, it was very focused on bookmaking and fixed odds and shops rather than the pool. Um, we want to change that. We want to have a company that's completely focused on pool betting on British horse racing. We'll provide some other services alongside that, but that's going to be front of mind. So we're going to have a modern long course infrastructure. We're going to have new bet types. We're going to have uh, guarantees around some of the exotic pools in particular. Uh, we're going to have uh, a cash out uh, um, offer whereby in certain of the exotic bets, you can cash out before you get to the end and get some money. Uh, even before, without having to test out the last few legs. Uh, that's something that's been worked very well in the fixed odds market. We think that's going to be very attractive to our customers. Uh, and things such as crowdfunded bets. So maybe have some celebrities or pundits have their idea about what a, a, uh, a, a multi-leg bet might look like uh, and have customers able to buy a stake in that bet uh, as, a, as, a, as a crowdfunded bet. Bring your own device, BYOD. Um, so uh, we are looking at self-service, but self-service on your mobile phone through an app. You can get cash onto the phone uh, and use that and cash out at the end of the day. Um, it also provides an easy step through to account betting. Uh, and so it'll be very mobile first, as we all know everything's moving to um, a mobile phone structure. Uh, we're going to upgrade the whole presentation screen system on course, uh, how we present the, the will pays, how we promote betting, get people interested, uh, what, the, what the, the tipsters are saying, these kind of things. That doesn't appear on any of the screens at the moment. That will be new uh, and we'll be operating over a cloud-based network. This is a modern uh, new system, which effectively a modular system, which allows us really to be very nimble on our feet, which is something that uh, on the whole tote systems haven't been in the past. 
So there's an example, for example, of a, of a screen design. Um, it's not just the will pays, it's got a time form, time form recommendation, star system, promoting different bets. Gives us lots more flexibility to do things with our customers. There's some other screenshots for vertical screens uh, and uh, how one might sign up through bring your own bet, bring your own device and bet on your mobile phone while you're on course. It's going to be a strong link with our media content. I mean, I think it was very clear from uh, Richard's presentation that these days, and we saw, I think we saw it in Manchester United as well yesterday, these days we are our own media. We have to provide our own content. We have to speak to our uh, customers ourselves as well as through all our media channels and luckily in racing we have all those opportunities. So BritBet will be the nominated pool betting outlet linking to the sale of pictures from our partner race courses. Uh, those 55 race courses all have social and customer channels. About 5 million race goers a year go come to those race courses and we'll be able to ex speak to those customers exclusively uh, as race goers. We'll be able to showcase racing and pool betting together and those opportunities through, uh, through those channels, both uh, uh, UK racing and international racing. It, for the first time, it creates uh, British racing, it gives us the opportunity to promote racing from overseas. And I think that's a great opportunity um, that we'd like to talk to many of you about, uh, putting in reciprocal arrangements in place. And uh, the, there are lots of, uh, we already have television channels and other media channels in the UK. You have Racing UK, which is wholly owned by uh, 37 race courses. Uh, and at the races, Sky Racing, which uh, it has the other Cape race courses are all involved with. So those will be key channels for promoting BritBet. There are a few challenges. Uh, so it's worth just quickly showing that we are dealing with those. Um, there is an exclusive license in place until the end of 12th of July, and we're allowed to start operations on the 13th of July. So we have no opportunity for parallel running or anything like that. It's got to be ready to go on a fixed launch date. So we've had to gear up our plans for that, and we're confident that we can do that. Uh, there's obviously a transition of technology on course. Um, luckily, most of the same staff will transfer from the tote through to BritBet. So we'll have the same staff, but we have to, they'll be using different operating platforms. So that will have to be dealt with through training and in that transition. There'll be a transition of international co-mingling with racing's partners overseas. Uh, 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 obviously, there will be ITSP connections uh, straight away, ready to be tested. Um, but equally, uh, we will want to see, uh, and I think it would be an advantage for some of the more direct, um, uh, uh, direct interfaces, which allow the more exotic bets to be co-mingled. We're going to have to educate our customers about the transfer. Um, but we're going to make that as easy as possible. We have plenty of people on staff who are on, on course, staff on course who are used to that, used to dealing with our customers. Uh, so we're prepared for that. There's clearly a risk of fragmentation of pools. If you have Tote and BritBet, uh, on each course, it will be very simple because there'll only be one on each course. But off course, there's a potential for confusion. But we think there's also a potential for collaboration uh, and reciprocal commingling. Uh, and uh, although we, we have uh, less than two months now, we still think those opportunities exist and there are discussions going on about that. Uh, but the good thing for us is the single leg bets are almost 100% come through race course and international co-mingling. Uh, so that's an area that we'll control on day one. Uh, and of course, we want to work uh, with uh, British bookmakers and betting services uh, on a B2B service. This is not competitive to fixed odds. We see this as... Uh, an additional product for the fixed odds bookmakers to, uh, to retail on our behalf. So we launch on the 13th of, I've said June there, I think it should be, should be July. Uh, um, just in case our managing director is watching, I haven't improved it by a month. Um, BritBet will control on course an international racing to racing distribution. Uh, there'll be potential collaboration off course uh, race courses have proven that they can improve customer service and experience on course. We've done that by bringing catering and a whole lot of other services in in house, and I'm get, I'm certain that we'll achieve that with the betting as well. So pool betting will become uh, hopefully a return to a growth area for UK racing, be uh, the dawning of a new era. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, Simon. So ladies and gentlemen, Winfried had asked me to become involved in this session in the discussion because I think very courageously, Winfried said, you're from the outside. And when you're from the outside, sometimes you ask questions that don't have the specific education that comes from working in the industry and you can also make people feel uncomfortable. So <laughs> let's start that way, shall we? Winfried, you remember Mumbai, I wasn't there. But when I was looking at the content of the Asian Racing Conference two years ago in Mumbai, there was this graphic, which I believe came from the Hong Kong Jockey Club, and it showed different sports and their revenue streams and the percentage that came from broadcast, from commercial rights, from match day, race day events. And in racing, it showed 65% of racing's income comes from wagering. Is racing as a whole comfortable with that? How important is it to diversify, do you feel, the income stream across various sources? I think it's, uh, the, the clear dependency is and will be from wagering income. Because I think that's probably, if you look at the competitive advantage which horse racing has in this, and in a way that's the natural attraction regarding wagering, uh, uh, wagering uh, uh, propensity of our customers. I think in an ideal world, we would in a way definitely further diversify our income and have more income streams when it comes, especially sponsorship uh, ETC. But it goes back what we discussed yesterday. If you are not be able to widen the fan base and attract customers who in a way, especially in the beginning, start with other income streams, uh, if you don't attract them, it's a, uh, the dependency will even deepen. And I think if you not be able to widen the fan base, if you not become more popular, especially the aspect of sponsorship income, which is, if you look, in a, it's a key in a way in growth. And the other one is TV income, because uh, if you look at football, uh, if you are not a popular sport, people will not pay for your TV rights. One of the few examples we quoted yesterday would be, theoretically, uh, the Kentucky Derby. That would be, definitely has a premium and can attract us. So the dependency is still in a way in relation to, and will be in relation to the wagering side. But to diversify, and this is probably uh, in, if you look at Great Britain, Great Britain has a different model where the dependency is not as much on, uh, on the wagering side. But one of the key income streams of the race courses is the entry fee, the, enter, the, the gate money. And I think that the gate money, from my perspective, being a customer, would, is so high that it is a barrier for going racing. Because if you go in a normal race meeting, 30 pounds, 35 pounds, 40 pounds is a normal fee you have to pay. And that, I think, doesn't in a way help you to drive your especially more casual customers to come. Maybe, uh, yes, Simon. I feel like I probably should follow, that, follow on from that one. Um, uh, I mean, a, a, a entrance money um, is very important. Um, the prices that Winfried talked about were definitely at the top end. Uh, you can go racing much cheaper than that. Um, but equally, uh, we have experimented with uh, price. That we're getting more uh, um, clever about how we price things at different times of the day for different groups of people. But equally, you have to be very careful. The, the, it's a constant debate in the UK when they go to France or they go to America, and you can go racing essentially for free. Um, and the feeling is, well, why don't we do that in the UK? But equally, I think the, the, the other side of that is people do not value going racing in those countries. And you can see it when you go many days. It's, there is not really much of a buzz or a customer experience around it. And so you have to be careful about how you price things because that tells people how you value it as well. Uh, it's a very tricky area. You, you, we definitely don't want it to be too expensive, but we also don't want to be seen as a cheap, a cheap activity. If we want to be seen as a premium activity, you have to present it as a premium activity. That's how you get not just the race, the race day revenues, but that's how you get the media rights, which again, very important in the UK, and the sponsorship. Uh, and for me, the real thing is you have to turn it around. I think Winfred absolutely got it on the button yesterday, which is instead of thinking, how do, how do, we, um, how do we, people want to bet, therefore we can present them racing. Now that people in the UK has probably had to deal with this more than any other market, it's the most competitive, vibrant, um, a varied betting market in the world where people can bet on any sport. Um, in that environment, the old way of doing things, even in the UK, which was 
you want to have a bet, therefore you have to get into racing. You have to turn that around and say, you need to be interested in racing and therefore you'll have a bet on it rather than on the sports that you know, and the other sports you know and love. You've got to present it as a sport, not as a betting product. If people engage with it as a sport and you have and the leisure and the entertainment that all has to go around that, then people will bet on it. And I suppose another way that betting has changed a lot in the past few years is the proliferation of internet-based betting companies. And of course, in the UK, it was uh, in between Mumbai and Seoul here uh, that the British government, the Minister for Sport, said that there was a plan to change the horse racing betting levy because specifically of offshore uh, betting firms and the contributions that needed to be made from those companies into British horse racing. Um, how has that changed? In fact, David, you were talking about Tab Corp having an office in the Isle of Man. Has anything changed in terms of uh, the way your company used to give revenue back to horse racing uh, compared to what is happening now with these offshore bases? Um, so I think there's two ways I look at. Um, I'd like to answer the first question you asked, which is I don't think racing is, can be likened to any other sport in that it actually is intrinsically linked to wagering. Um, most people who get involved in watching or following racing wager on it. Mm. That is very different from um, most sports out there. That's the first thing. The, the second thing is it is really hard to fund a racing industry if you don't have an effective funding model with your wagering businesses. It is really hard, and you've seen that in the low prize money in the UK. Mm -hmm. And the UK survives on that low prize money because if you own a horse in the UK, you have other jurisdictions close by that you can go and compete in such, and, and seek uh, prize money from those. So it is a really tough market to own a horse in. And, and, and if you talk to the owners in the UK, one of their key gripes is they desperately need an increase in prize money. And, and when I look at the fees that flow back to racing in the UK, the model is a really tough model to fix. It's got multiple uh, parties involved. You're seeing a pool that's going to be split further. It's only 3% of that market. Split it further. That's a really hard model to make money out of. Um, and you know, as, I, as I look at that business, I'll be fascinated to see in two years' time you know, whether they've made a go of it because I think it's high risk and a really tough with essentially the Gambling Commission in the UK introducing much stricter controls around how you can recruit customers, know your customer uh, um, restrictions, et cetera, that are going to make it a very tough business to run unless you put a lot of resources behind it. Um, well, so we'll, come, we'll come back in two years' time and explain how <laughs> to succeed. But it's, uh, we are paying more than we have done and we're paying more back to the UK. Betting on UK racing is, is what generates money back to the UK. The Isle of Man connects into the UK tote. Without doubt, we'll, we'll work with uh, this new business. We also work with Chester and Chester Bet. Um, we are there to support innovation in racing, wherever it comes from. Could I do only a follow-up question? Because if you look at pools, the greatest advantage of pool betting is then liquidity. And why, in a way, what were the reasons why using UK could not agree to one united pool approach? I mean, I don't think it's worth going into the detail of that, but, but um, uh, we, there were discussions between us and Betfred about whether that could be done. Uh, I think even the, the Betfred is owned really by one man, um, yeah. and, and he has publicly said he doesn't really do partnerships. Hmm. Um, and that's certainly yes, what yeah. we've discovered. Yeah. Um, our view is, um, yes, it's split liquidity, but you have to look at it by bet type. Yep. All the single leg, almost 100% of the single leg liquidity comes through the race courses and through our media yep. rights. Um, so that we will yep. control. Yep. Uh, and then we'll have to see how we get yep. on with the exotics. I think yep. there are still opportunities there, but yep. I think the fact that it's less than 3% of the market, that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you know, if, if, if it's almost nothing splitting, the, the, what difference does actually splitting the liquidity yep. make? If you can build from there, which is our plan, if we can add, you know, okay, maybe we split the liquidity and it becomes one and a half percent or two percent. But then if we can add one or two percent to that, it makes a material difference. Mm. It's maybe interesting to, that Richard would share, because we do commingling, and how much, without going to commercial secrets, how much comes from UK 
And I think it shows that pool betting in UK has, if well managed, well structured, is a competitive product. Yeah, obviously we have uh, multiple partners coming from the UK, but you are talking about um, constantly on an average race day in Hong Kong, more than um, I would say, it can range from 12 to 15 million um, pound per day. So I think there's still, but, um, but, but of course, you, so I think there's still a pretty rich market when it comes Absolutely. to interest of pool betting, given the deep pool size and also the availability of the exotic bets. Yeah, I think you've pro you proved there's an opportunity there. Uh, Richard, let's um, look at um, this issue of age. Uh, Brandt had mentioned shifting customer preferences. In the research you've done in some of the uh, presentation, you talked about uh, using, the, again, the internet, of course, to capture a younger audience. What, what does your research show in terms of the average age of people who are prepared to uh, interact with racing through the internet and also about you know, addressing uh, the key trends for younger and older people involved in racing? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, when you talk about the younger um, generation, I think our strategy has been start engaging young adults um, when they, you know, when they first joined the work, when they initially joined the workforce. And what that happens is a lot of them actually happens in the race course. Um, and since, for example, in Happy Valley, we act, our race course is reasonably close to the financial district, um, is reason so we actually are able to attract and with some of our corporate offering, we are pretty good position in terms of attracting like the young accountant, the young lawyer into go racing. So I would say usually we will start with about um, 25 to 30. But then the issue of the issue for this group is they are very they are in a very busy time period of their life. Um, unlike the senior citizen. So as a result, they might be only, so first there are two things. One is through our CRM, we want to make sure they can really go to go racing at least seven to eight times per year, because racing is a bit of a habit. If you only goes one year, there's really not much you can build a habit. So we have to reinforce that. And secondly is again, using the digital social media is very important because this is where um, people in Hong Kong looking at the, I think on average people look at their, during the daytime look at their cell phone in Hong Kong every seven minutes, some stats like that. So I think that's very important to create both a physical race cost unique experience as well as the whole digital experience. Uh, David, Yesterday, Niall Sloan from ITV had said that racing is so particular because uh, people are having fun while they're losing money. He was talking about broadcasting events itself. How much are you concentrating and how much are you trying to make sure that people are having fun while they're interacting uh, in terms of the uh, time that they're spending thinking of making the bet and then placing the bet and then depending on what the result is? How much are your people thinking about that in terms of addressing the customer. I think um, that's intrinsically at the heart of building a successful wagering business. It's an entertainment business. You're competing for the entertainment dollar. Uh, whether it's uh, betting on racing or betting on sport, it's about how you package it. It's about making it interesting. It's about providing information and, and opportunities to engage in it in the lead up to the event. It's providing attractive social media chatter around it. Um, and, it's, and it's really about creating that whole customer journey that means they want to come back to you and not go to your competitor next time. So it's a, it's a continuous evolution. And we're continuing now to develop or try and develop the next generation of the way customers are going to interact, whether it's via Alexa and, or other, other means to get their information. Um, we're, we're, we're like the Hong Kong Jockey Club and other uh, companies around the world looking at how customers are evolving and they are evolving very fast. Richard, you're holding the microphone. You want to say something? Yeah, I guess um, just to your question, I think focusing on how much, what's your win? Um, because a, a lot of times, even when I go to Europe, when I look at the newspaper, I see, okay, if I follow this trainer with a $1 bet for the whole season, most of the time you'll see a negative number. And that's actually not the right, we, we don't think that's the right way ones um, to engage, ones to actually position racing as entertainment. And a lot of time we ask fans, actually, what do you, I mean, even for the younger generation, what do you get out of it from your whole night of, you know, racing and betting? You know, they would say, okay, I socialize with my friends. 
um, they will tend to remember of their striking experience instead of their winning experience because not everyone would actually in the end actually count how much money they come in and when they come out. And also, one thing which is more, impor more important um, in, the next gen in the younger generation than the current generation is um, the amount, the opportunity that they can brag about. A lot of time, actually people today entertain themselves and feel good about themselves, about sharing pictures of themselves, yeah. taking pictures of the food, or on the meal, or like on the dishes that they have actually just eaten. They like to brag about it. And so the fact that people like even sharing a winning ticket or even sharing the knowledge that they know racing, sharing the fact that now I take a lot of time when I mention the ring leaders, why they like to be, become a non-paid ambassador for racing is because they, by going to the race course, showing their friends, that now you know I can book this venue. I can actually I know that some of the people here. I know some of the jockeys. It's already a emotional appeal to them. So I think that would should be the angle um, to focus on um, than the one dollar bet on a particular trainer because more of them are actually negative. Simon, yeah, I, I think that's a really important thing. I think it's it's quite interesting. Certainly, in the, coming from a fixed odds market, although I think it's true in pool betting markets as well. Having been to the Korean Derby, is r r betting tends to be a very individual thing, solitary thing. Um, I think we need to make it a social thing and I think pool betting is the perfect way of doing it because you can create pools between groups of people and somebody has to win as opposed to in fixed odds where generally it's the house that wins. So I think pool betting has a real advantage if we can get into social betting. Winfrey. I think it would be interesting we had yesterday's session talking about how we want to widen the fan base and from a branding position that it's very important not to position it too much wage wing driven. How you see it, David, from your perspective? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's an interesting one. You, you want to position the events like the Everest to stand up in their own right and be an entertainment event that people want to go to and enjoy themselves at. And then you want to make sure that all the other events that sit around it that aren't the major events of the month attract a reasonable halo effect of additional betting. And what we see is if you have major events every month that are the headlights that get people engaged, you get that halo effect across the other race meetings that allows you to keep that, that level of growth and interest from your customers. Okay, so we're out of time, but just to set up the next session, Brandt, we haven't heard from you just in this brief chat, because in your uh, relatively new job as Chief Regulatory Officer at the BHA, you're responsible also for the integrity function, and we'll next talk yes. about integrity after the coffee break. So just tell us about the relationship between wagering and integrity as you see it. Yes, look, I mean, uh, this, is, this is often a, a challenging environment. Uh, there has been a progression over recent years to separate the commercial functions and integrity functions of the racing industry globally. That's, that's been a trend. Uh, but I think it, it's important to recognise that one can't have regard for one component of the industry uh, without regard for the other. As David and, and Winifred have all said today, I mean, it, it is wagering which drives the industry. So regard must be had for that. Uh, in terms of the uh, integrity of the sport, more and more money is being invested internationally uh, and in Britain into protecting the integrity of not just racing but all sports. And it's pleasing to see that other sports are embracing uh, many long-standing uh, practices and models that have been developed through, through racing. No, the, the original link to wagering in the racing industry uh, has meant that we have very developed and mature systems for protecting the integrity of the sport and that, that can't be forgotten. And so progressively other sports are improving their, their approach to the integrity of racing also. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your coffee break. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. Well, yeah.